Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Women and Children First space. My name is H Melt. I use they them pronouns, and I am the poetry coordinator at the bookstore. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which Women and Children First sits is the occupied territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor native histories, literature, and communities. We encourage you to research whose land you're on in your own homes and communities. Women and Children First is currently closed to the public for in-store browsing, but we are processing online orders, doing curbside pickup, and shipping across the country every single day. Um, we are hosting many virtual events, which are all listed on womenandchildrenfirst.com. And you can also watch recordings of past virtual events here on our Crowdcast channel or on our YouTube page, which has closed captioning. Um, tonight, we are very excited to virtually welcome two incredible authors and artists who were both born in Chicago, um, which is very exciting for us as Women and Children First is based in Chicago. Um, tonight, we are hosting Rhonda Girard, author of the new memoir, Love is an Ex Country, who will be in conversation with Leila Abdel Razak. Uh, who Women and Children first hosted a couple of years ago um, for her graphic novel, Badawi. Both authors tonight are fierce cultural organizers who demand that Palestinian stories be heard. And they also uplift other writers and artists through various projects like the Radius for Arab American Literature, collaborating with Misna, which is a critical platform for contemporary Arab film, literature, and art, and Mamul Press, which Layla co-founded. Um, just an FYI, you can click the green button at the bottom of your screen in the middle there to buy this beautiful, incredible book. So please do that. Feel free to drop comments in the chat um, during the conversation. And I'm going to hand it over to our guest tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Hi, Layla. Hi, so good to see you. I love this. I was telling Layla that her computer fan reminds me of like, like we're on some cool free Palestinian transportation device going back home Take off. You know, taking off going back to the Palestine. It's so excited to talk to you about like your work and um just general Palestinian cartoonery and amazingness. All kinds. <laughs> I think like Jennifer Kanker is here she was lined up for it. Yeah, I see Jennifer in the chat. I see some lovely friends. I have one of my old copies of Juicy Mother from like back when it first came out. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you like what, if you can like talk to us about like who were some of your like early influences and yeah, we can just like chat together about drawing and just um, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. This uh, mic on this computer is sometimes problematic, so if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll yell. But um, <laughs> uh, we'll see here, but when you're yelling kind of close, I can hear you really well. Okay. There you go. Okay, I will sit close to the computer and yell. <laughs> um. So. I remember being in a Chicago thrift store um, and coming across the work of Julie Doucet. Do you know about this artist? No. She writes, actually, I think you might enjoy her work. She is like a French Canadian cartoonist who does these comics, like very perverse and strange dream comics. And Comics. How do you spell her name? Um, so it's J U L I E, and her last name is D O U C E T. And her comic is called 
dirty plot, which I guess plot is like pussy. And I don't know, I was like 15 when I came across this comic book and I was in love with it. Um, and I think she's seriously one of my most favorite early inspirations. Um, yeah, Camelia wrote in the chat. Thank you. What about you? Like, I love, yeah, I, so when I was little, um, my dad, our house just had a copy of this, um, Naji Ali, like this old Naji, this is like, these are old like scribbles I made when I was like four or five on this like old ass Naji Ali book. Okay, I got um, the book and I got it in Lebanon. Like, you did? That's amazing. Yeah, this book like rocked my world when I was little because it was just really subversive. Like I'll show some of the photos. Like this is like this is like the kind of like the the fidei inside the bottle with the hatta on it. And um yeah, like just having like weird this Shatila, this Sabra and Shatila piece that's like. There's, I think there's a comic in there that's like um, this little boy. I don't know if you've seen it in there, but it's like he gets a, he's like in a hospital bed and he gets a gift. And then it turns out to be shoes and he takes the blanket off and his feet are like gone. Right off. Yeah. Oh my God. When I saw that comic for the first time, something about his face, like. I don't know, the expression that Najib had me drew in that image just like really hurt my soul. <laughs> yeah. He yeah, has like such a such a like gift with working with that with Hanzala as like a character. Um and like a stand in. Oh, is this it? I found it. Yeah. Oh my god, it's so sad. I find it very haunting. Yeah, I think the eyes too, because you never really see him. So like, this is kind of like, oh, is that him? Or, oh, that's true. Or it has this like weird hunting, definitely. But I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you, how did you come up with the idea of like, like I love how in, for example, in Fadzawi, you separate panels with like, um, embroidery. I just like love this technique so much. So when did you decide that you could do that or how did you come up with it or what was I your was trying, I was trying to figure out like what does a Palestinian aesthetic mean for me and yeah. embroidery and try to incorporate it into my comics. That's like an old, old one from the webcomic, like one of the first that I did on the webcomic. Mm. But like, um, then I learned that in my family's village, they don't really do that kind of embroidery. Like there's different textile traditions like later. And it really made me question like, well, it also learned about the history of Palestinian embroidery as something that was like proliferated in the camps um, as like a way of survival and to give like Palestinian the craft to a source of income and then it like spread out and became like a stand-in for all of Palestinian culture even though like back in the day like not everybody had that particular tradition of embroidery as like major mm -hmm. like clothing traditions it really like I don't know it's so interesting when I started to learn more about it and I was like wow I was I was searching for something that I thought was like the most authentic version yeah. of in this, but then like there was more to it, like there were more layers that I wasn't aware of and I don't know, I feel like that's that's kind of a cool thing about where the is growing, which I guess is like different. Yeah, I think you back at your old work and you can see how you've changed. Do you ever feel that way with like so. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I really, but at the same time, like, I think this search for 
like the authentic Palestinianness, an authentic kind of like sense of being Palestinian is really common for people who either never lived in Palestine or um, maybe have one Palestinian parent. But I think like as I've gotten older, I've realized that like that is actually another function of being Palestinian, is like not going to Palestine because you could, you know? Um, and also like being cut off from traditions and not knowing like what you didn't know about your particular village or your particular family embroidery traditions versus traditions in camps versus traditions, you know, in like historical philosophy and all of these different ways. But I still think it's a really cool element, you know, to see I'd never seen something like that. So in a way, like it made me feel more connected to Palestine. So yeah, like whenever I do look back on my old work, there are moments where I'm like, oh, cringe. But then I realized, yeah, but that's, that might be a reflection for someone else. Yeah, and that's also like an authentic thing because it's how you connect to it from your positionality. You know, like, and, and diaspora, like exactly what you were saying, like diaspora and not going to Palestine because of like the, the particular oppression that I'm feeling with, like is the transit to the Palestinian experience too. Yeah, exactly. It's really um, oh, yeah. Um, it's really funny, like, when I saw the title of your book for the first time, and I was like, I feel like this title, that was the next country, is like this signal, or like, or, like, as a Palestinian, if I, like, didn't know who the Lajarad is, and I see this book called Love is a Next Country by the Lajarad on the bookshelf, I feel like that would be, like, a like a flag, like, this is Palestine, like, but it's like, not, I don't know, it's almost like a, or something, like a, it's like, it's this coded phrasing that you'll like recognize if you have been part of that experience and maybe gloss over it or understand the way you have it. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, it's like it, it is kind of like my like maybe my attempt at a bat signal of some kind. Like, <laughs> yeah, like a bat signal. Yeah, just being able to like hope that those layers are coming through the readers. Um, and, like a really old version was X Country without an O, but I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe putting the word cunt on my book cover. Although, like, I think maybe at some point, camel cunt, uh, one of the things that someone called me a couple of years ago is also a working title for something. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I remember, like, talking to old editors and, like, people who were looking at that book and a lot of them said, well, if we could have like a map or some sort of visualization of like the central, you know, um, cross country trip that you make, then it would kind of make more sense. Because like, I was purposefully making it so that like a reader who didn't have a lot of intersections um, would just be kind of like confounded. They'd be like, wait, I thought we were on a cross-country road trip and like all of a sudden you're like in you know Israel being detained and then you're like you know in Egypt in the 80s or Palestine in the 90s or whatever um but yeah so like the first thing I thought was like oh I would love if they like would you know sort of like give her take on these locations and so I'm really glad that you were able to do that. I was mm -hmm. flattered and really excited when I got the email. Um, I was like, of course, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, um, as I was writing it, I was just taking some notes. And I think somewhere in the book, we talk about, like, I was writing this book about my body. And I think it's really incredible how, like, through this road trip and these 
is through perspective and time. It's like it's almost like a landscape of your body across time and space. Um, through all of these like different lived interactions and like the ways that these locations have impacted your body carry these locations in your body throughout the book. And I just thought that was so present throughout everyone's story. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. That was definitely the goal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love, um, so those of you who don't have a copy of the book, um, and the Kindle should have this too, there's, um, or the ebook version, the opening map is a map that Layla made. Um, and, it's 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 supposed to be you know supposedly the idea is i went from west to east on the trip um but the you know in our conversations i really wanted the map to look like not intuitive and non-linear so it's got this really cool way of going where it goes west to east and then north <laughs> and then south and then back to west yeah there we go almost in a circle yeah i love it i love the ways that you know you just kind of as a palestinian it's you know that old saying anywhere you go there you are is like so <laughs> um perfect for us because it's true we we, I, or I should even just me, for me, I feel like I'm constantly moving to chase some sort of replica of that original place where I wish I was um, and where I wish I hadn't been uprooted or where I wish I'd been able to be with my maternal family or my paternal um, family members who are women and femme. Um, but yeah, I thank you for capturing. I feel like you captured those moments really well. Um, I'm looking at I'm looking at like one of my other favorite things you've made, which is the the opening, <laughs> which I, I really love. Uh, What's that? I remember I showed you one of the first drafts. Or you were one of the first people I showed, like, the draft of Is that when we were in South Carolina? Yeah, so for Rawi, um, Juju Safa, who's an amazing uh, nonfiction writer and fiction writer, um, hosted us, like, a bunch of Arab American writers and poets and novelists and comic artists to um, stay in this beach house. And yeah we got to share some of our early work and um i remember you shared this and i cried i just remember crying because it was so powerful um a lot of people have been asking me like how do you write about really traumatic painful like memories and what advice do you have for people who want to do the same do you have any wisdom to share or even just personal ideas? I feel like, at least from the little I've shared <laughs> in my work and the, you know, things that I've tackled, I guess, it's just like, it takes so much bravery. And that's like what I kept thinking as I was reading this book, just like how much fucking bravery it takes. But also, you can't keep it inside. Like, you can't not say it. And yeah, exactly. And the best way to say it is just to say it. And that's the thing about your writing is it's just so, like, this is what it is. <laughs> like, here it is. <laughs> like, you're very straightforward in the way that you relay, relay these memories. Um, And yeah, it's it's brave and it's scary, but it's also like you you have to 
a lot of sense because like I think there's an idea that you know by the time you start writing I mean I think it, it's like this idea that writing is like cooking or something where you have all these ingredients okay and now you're ready and then you're gonna sit down and just put it all together and but the process of the writing is really I mean it takes it takes me a really long time like some of these essays were written seven years before the book came out. A bulk of them were written between 2015 and 2017. But that took it, took, it takes such a long time to put together a narrative about something painful. I think. And through the, through the narrative making, there's so much that gets transmuted, finally, right? Like, I think that's why there's not a lot of writing about happy things. <laughs> Yeah. There's no process. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Um, when you were writing some of these essays, did you know that you wanted to put them in the book? Or did they sort of, okay? Well, the early ones, like, you know, I wrote a couple of really short early ones. I never thought, I was basically only writing at some point five page personal essays. And then, I miraculously wrote a 10 page personal essay. They just kept getting longer. And then I realized that they were all part of something, which was my body and the way that it travels and the way it perceives, is perceived, could be perceived, like the dream idea of not dealing with the perception, all of these different things, right? So. I think in 2015 is when I realized, oh, these aren't just like, oh, a little thing or a thing I wrote, right? Like, th these are like chapters in a book. Um, and that actually happened with my first book, too, my first novel. You know, a lot of those were little shorter pieces. And then, like, a mentor sat me down and just said, well, books are just chapters. Books are pages. Books are... You don't just do this giant thing, you build it slowly um, and deliberately, if you're lucky. So, yeah, I think just getting getting all that time to do it was really good. When did you, did you have like a point where you were like, I need to write about this? Yeah, I was in Marfa, it was 2015. And I was there for the Lennon residency and I was like in this house reading Maria Rankin and being like, this is incredible. This is like, this woman's a goddess. And then like leaving, my, leaving the house and realizing she was literally gonna be my neighbor and we were gonna be able to drink together and talk about things. And seeing that she was just a person who has her own and all of all of these things that go into being a poet and an artist when you're a woman and you're a mother, like it was just it was like a sign, you know, and I was like I was seeing all these like giant weird land installations that were made by dudes who were just like like just imagining a, imagining a cisgendered okay man maybe a gay man maybe a straight man but or a bisexual man but definitely a cisgendered white man just like building blocks like in the outdoors and being like yo did it like just like flexing on like the simplest most basic shit i'd ever seen and like having all of this wealth 
this generational wealth to be able to own. Like, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's it's angelic. <laughs> but also, like, I just felt like, well, yeah, I feel like I can I can make something. Like, I can just. And initially, I was like, just even if it's only ninety pages, like I want to make like a sexy ninety page, like not quite poetry, um, but definitely not fiction. But so I think that's part of what a lot of writers do. Like we kind of trick ourselves into, you know, making our art too. We're like, oh, it'll be really short. Oh, this is a short. This is a very easy project. <laughs> But then you're like, oh shit, I'm in a project, and it's gonna take. Like, how do you like when you're starting something, right? Because I think making graphic novels and comic books is like it just seems so time consuming. Um, can you talk about like, have you ever tricked yourself? What is it like? Yeah, absolutely. Badawi was a huge trick in the beginning. I was like, I'm making a web comic. I can do a chapter whenever I want. It doesn't have to be in any order. I can just draw random things that are stories that have been told me growing up. And then, like, I had, to, had all these, like, random stories and had to figure out how they all, like, connect to each other. Um, which, like, you know, I mean, things, like, are out of order in relation to when they happen in my dad's life and that book at times, but it's because it's, like, you have to make them fit together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like for my zines, it's the same thing. Um, but I feel like now I'm going to work on a new book, and it's really hard to like. Just, I realize that I have to just stop making excuses and start drawing. Like, no, oh. I can't wait for the whole like book to be figured out to start drawing. Like. I've really never worked that way. Like I always start with a particular scene that I have really clearly in my head and I start drawing it. But like, you can't only write it. Like I have to actually draw it to understand what the story is. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Like so you have I, to actually create the thing to figure out the thing. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like I can have like a script done and like, you know, Submit that somewhere. It's like I actually have to like fully flesh out and illustrate a section of the book to figure out what the other pieces of it are. And it's I don't know if that's how graphic novels are supposed to happen because I like just as a person with a web comic who got a feel it has been like done random like shorter comics and scenes. But like, I'm into this. Yeah, I kind of want to talk to you about this because I feel like, like as you know, we talk about this a lot. Like as Arab American poet writers, or like we don't really have, we're not we're not white women who are white straight white men who are getting mentor mentorship and all of this shit. But we're also like in this weird space where we have freedom because of that like nobody was like oh this is how you make it so we kind of get to feel like we invented the real so there's like you know obviously a need for more mentorship but i feel like because you got to make that you know you got to make these decisions yourself do you feel do you worry or do you take time or do you take time to kind of appreciate that and enjoy like that kind of ability to be able to do that I, I, yeah i mean like, i think i think i do appreciate it but i think it's okay so like i just signed with an agent for the first time in my life which like i've had a book published since 2019 i've had an agent that whole time <laughs> and like you know now i have so I'm doing things the right way, like starting to. Right, um, but but that's only in terms of capital, like or, right. or your 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 book as an object, right? Yeah. Which 
you know, like, yeah, we all we all enter into that choice at some point. Not all of us, obviously. There are people who don't want to do this. Right. Um, yeah, I and mean, I don't blame them sometimes. But like, yeah, you enter, you're entering into an agreement of sorts. And yeah, an agent is a person who like helps you deal with the contractual stuff so that you don't have to freak out about your property <laughs> being, you know, used by Urban Outfitters on a t-shirt or whatever, right? So, yeah, I think that, like, agents are can be very useful. But definitely not necessary. But I guess it's just what I'm saying is that it's sort of new territory for me because now, like, I never went through the process of, like, pitching something, so I don't actually what that looks like and how it fits into my creative process and if it fits into my creative process or how I need to change my creative process in order to make it fit into like what the publisher needs and it's very like it's pretty intimidating. It is because honestly I find that it's it's basically like an externalization of a very uh, internal and private process. So you're going through this internal private process that you for me, like I don't feel like I have to understand it, and like I would rather just go with the flow, which kind of puts me in a pickle when it comes to teaching because then I have to externalize. Okay, like how do how do you create like a fierce character? Like how do you work with first person? Like how can you teach these things that these skills that you have without being like, well, you go through a war, <laughs> um, you lose your homeland. <laughs> <laughs> you have a dad that's like this and a mom like that, like that's like this. Genetically, you're predisposed to this, and like, then you write like this. I mean, you can't say that, right? You have to actually externalize the things and yes. the plot, the plot, and it's just like it. It's just it feels so antithetic to being an artist. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it's also been a huge stumbling block for me starting. Just now, I don't want to start, but it's just like I feel like all this time I've had it in my head that I'm supposed to do it a right way this time, and I don't know what that way is. Um, You're doing it the right way, yeah, yeah, exactly like the badass way, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I don't know. It's funny, like the mental blocks. I think they're super common. I talk to people all the time who, yeah, like there are all these ways that we sometimes don't want to make certain compromises or admit things. But I mean, it sounds like it's okay. It's okay to want more than a certain number of people to read your book. Like, but it feels weird, right? Like I remember like in my twenties, it was just like, I wrote for my fucking blog, you know? And like all of us had these cute blogs in the early 2000s. You know, some of us are still writing books and some of us are critics. And like, it's just people were just like writing for like maybe a hundred or 200 other people. So it was kind of like, it just, it feels like that's, I mean, that's kind of what Russia was like, right? Like. Like people wrote, like, what to say, um, Turkinev or something, or like maybe check off. They only wrote for like 200 people. It was very <laughs> insular. Yeah. So, what I love about an agent is, you know, hopefully they hook you up with someone who, I mean, I think about someone like Etel Hadman, right? Who has her own test. Like, like someone who like dropped out of this process. And I realized that Etel Adnan didn't become like a well-known writer or artist until she was 87 years old. She's 95 now. She's a fucking goddess. Yeah, absolutely. To move, you know, but she she's very open about the fact that she had money. She came from money, generational money, um, you know, she's part Turkish, part Greek, 
empires behind that. Um, and yeah, like what we need, the ways that we can be outsiders, but the, the invisibility of class privilege and all of that stuff is just, it's like really interesting to me. And, um, yeah, I, I love, I love that you're in this position like where you can like work with someone and did you say she was Palestinian? Yeah. Yes. So happy. That's so cool. Yeah. How did you find her? She reached out to me and was like, do you have any books? She found you. <laughs> That's what yes, I love it. I love that. She was like, I've been trying to into my Palestinian discourse, so I want to support some Palestinian artists and writers. I was like, okay. I yes. love this. I love this. I was talking to like a friend yesterday about how our dads are of this generation, they're in their 70s, where until very recently they told people they were Jordanian because they didn't want to deal with being called Palestinian in the U.S. And yeah, it's just like, My dad kind of amazing. Was, let's say he's Lebanese. So like, yeah. Lebanese. You know, it's really <laughs> amazing. Like what if, what if it was, what if, I feel like that should be a room for code for Palestinian lesbian. <laughs> like, I'm not Palestinian, I'm Lebanese and I'm Lebanese. We should do it. Let's make it a trend. Um, it is 10 to 6. Um, where are you, by the way? Are you in Detroit? Do you, do you feel comfortable? I'm in Ypsilanti. You're in Ypsilanti? Yes. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's not as bad as Ann Arbor, I will say that. No, of course not. No, it's definitely not as bad as Ann Arbor. It's really charming to me, but it's very cool, right? It's not cold. I felt, yeah, I got me in the cold and chilling. It felt very weird the entire time I was there. I just felt like I was doing naked part wheels. It was hot. I was like, ah. Uh. Why is everyone looking at me like this? <laughs> because everyone's just like so like timid and under a hundred pounds and just very, you know, fair and proper. And I just was like, I didn't have a fellowship so I don't have to work. Basically my entire career has been built on not wanting to work and working the least amount of days so that I can just write and get high, you know, get stones. Um, I can't hear you, so. I want to ask you about this chapter monument. Monument? Yeah. Yeah. Monument, it was like, oh, at the end of every paragraph, like, I don't know, it's so short, but it's so dense and full of messy, complicated ideas. And I was just wondering if you had to share a little bit about where this particular piece came from. Like, did it, did it proceed? The book, was it born, was it born, like? Yeah, no, it was a deliberate, very deliberate part of the book. And it's, so Monument is when I'm driving in 2016, I think, maybe 15. I'm driving through some, or uh, through Oklahoma City to look at the monument of the space that um, the Oklahoma City bombing happened, and how the monument was so like clinically 
it just feels so like um like very shiny and reflective and there's no pain there's no you know like you go to beirut and you like walk down the street and you see like this this old opera house that's like riddled with bullet holes and there's like spaces that where there's like like entire buildings are bombed out and pulled out or like where places where snipers would stand like you know it's bombed out but like you can still see kind of where the sniper would stand so like coming from like places like that where or like even egypt where people are just there's five thousand years of death right like under the surface there and life like everyone lived and died and so there's no cleaning up and sterilizing right there's just this is what it is um but i think fascism really loves sterilization empire fascism so um yeah just seeing this like shiny monument where it's in the bay and like just like these white dudes like created the biggest domestic act of violence um at the time i think there's now there's worse domestic acts of violence i'm not sure but they're 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 all done by white people by white men um and but also at the same time i think I was staying in like a weird hotel that felt really white. And I think Philando Castile had just been killed. And it was just there was there were like 85 things happening at the same time. And I really felt like I had to commemorate that. I took notes that entire trip, but a lot of the notes are really boring. They're just like you know messy layers of multiple things happening come through so intensely in this chapter, which I think is why, like, at the end of every paragraph, I was like, and then there's this one that I really love, where um, you're talking about driving through, you're driving from Oklahoma City to St. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis. And... Um, you're from Missouri, and you say that you're thinking and you're comparing it to like a carnival, like a, like a county fair almost. Yeah, a county fair. And you're saying that it's temporary, outwardly not committed, temporary, there were no homes. I drove past huge trailer home lots, nothing was here to stay. And just the idea of subverting the elements of settler colonialism in this land, like, and you seeing that settler colonialism as, like, a temporary thing just, like, opens up so many possibilities for other parts of the world, too, and, like, have bearings on other parts of the book. I don't know. Was, That's dope. Yeah. Like, Is that around the same time that I talk about Leslie Marmon Sulco's ceremony and how there's a witch ceremony in the book where the witch that that like can make the the creepiest spell wins and the the witch who invented white colonialism wins. <laughs> You're like, oh my god, that's it. That's the most terrifying thing ever. Take it back. And she's like, I can't. <laughs> it already started. You know. So even that idea of like to even taking back colonialism and being like, oh, you guys are just a story, a bad story you told each other to win something. You're not going to be here forever. We've been here forever. Like that kind of. But like also the scary flip side to that. Yeah, <laughs> like, like 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 Germans, you know? I'm fucking like. Like fucking Scandinavians, like seeing Syrians and Iraqis and Africans showing up and being like, we can't handle this. No, we've been here the most. You guys need to leave. Like, so the ways that, the ways that, that, um, those two are just simply not equal. <laughs> yeah. And one is much more dangerous. Um, 
But yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that chapter, writing that chapter and putting it together. And, um, I love everyone here. Thank you all for being here. I'm seeing like Cam and George and Rocky and Shian and Kiki. Kiki. Oh my God, Kiki! I'm wearing the fat cloth. <laughs> so Kiki Salem is a visual artist. Everyone, she's amazing. And um, you can go to Punk Ass Arab. This T-shirt says "Fat Cloth." Fat Cloth. The letters "Fat Cloth" in Arabic. And there's like a really cute, like, um, dancing. <laughs> what is this? Why is it like this? Oh. A camel. <laughs> On skates, and he's skating. Yeah, you can see the skates. I love these drawings. They're so cool. I love us. I love that we make um, these amazing things, and we share them with each other, and we honor each other, and um, I love, I love you guys. I love you so much, Leila. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sabuka. Um, yeah. So everyone is lovely. Um, I think they are going to cut us, but I don't know when. <laughs> if they don't cut us, we'll cut us. Thanks, Elise. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah thank you both, uh, Layla and Renda, for joining us this evening just a quick reminder do not forget to get love is an ex country incredible book um feel free to share this conversation it will be posted immediately after the recording will be up and shareable so feel free to share that around and thank you everyone for joining us for this incredible conversation uh love to you both have a good night everyone Bye. 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 Bye.